Hello, guys. See, we've got a few people snaggling in, straggling in. Uh, we got about a minute or two. We'll let people show up. Hope y'all been doing good this week. We'll give people a couple minutes to show up here. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope everybody's families are okay. Couple minutes till seven, so glad everybody's here tonight on a Thursday. All right, we'll go ahead and get things started. Um, uh, let's see, it's Thursday night, we've been going along pretty good. Uh, this is lesson three, and we're going to be talking about a lot of really cool stuff tonight. Talking about uh, uh, Druid spiritual practices are the, the things that are kind of the the uh, base the base of why we are what we are. And we'll get into that. We'll get into some of the symbolism and things like that. But first, before we even get started, I'm going to. Pour myself a shot, or part of a shot, because this bottle's almost empty. Set this over here. Get yourself a drink if you want to, and that is good. Hope everybody's having a good week. Oh, we're getting 25 people. All right. Let's get this going. Uh, before we get started, we're going to do like we normally do. I want everybody to just close their eyes for a minute. And we're going to chant the all win and just kind of get the energy of the evening set up. And I want you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath, and on the exhale, uh, uh, May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. All right. We've got 35 people here. It's good to have everybody here. Um, we've been doing a lot these last few weeks. We've been doing uh, this past Sunday. We did the Druid uh, Essentials, Bookshelf Essentials. Um, that was a fun show to do, a um, stream to do. Um, and also, in the past, we've done two other classes for Druid School Live. We did uh, Who Are the Druids? And then the second lesson that we did was uh, basically uh, talking about the gods. So, whenever we've learned about who and, who and how the Druids came about, and then we get the, uh, we get the uh, base of knowledge of who the gods and goddesses were, you have to move on to the next step. It's like, okay, so we know who and what the druids are, we know who and who and where the, the gods and their ideas came from. So you've got those two things that are, that are that are staring you right in the face and the next thing you got to think is okay druidry is a pagan spiritual tradition. Um, so what that means is there's something spiritual to it. Um, uh, it's like uh, I don't know. It's it's 
It's how we live this incarnation into the next, into the next. It's like our signpost. It's our guides and things like that. So it's like we are different from, and we're going to talk about how some of the differences. There are certain other pagan traditions that have uh, aspects that kind of borrow from Druidry. So we're going to talk about some of those. But we have uh, certain things that are ten, tend to be more directed towards those that are uh, druidic practitioners. Um, as an example, uh, there are a lot of traditions that are uh, loose in how that they um, uh, allow people into their tradition and things like that. Well, druidry tends to be a more uh, a more scholarly uh, initiatory tradition. In other words, like in witchcraft, you'll have uh, family rituals and things like that. You'll have rituals where it's like mostly tied for everybody, um, moms and dads and all this stuff, just general pagan practice that everybody, you know, can, you know, be a part of. But the one thing that you don't see a lot of is in Jersey, you don't see a lot of familial uh, practices there is I mean everybody has their own heart practices things that they do for themselves but as far as working within an order or working within a druidic tradition it tends to be a, a initiatory and directed towards adults it's not something that we necessarily you know teach to our kids we teach pagan traditions to our kids but as far as you know things that we are learning uh, as you know initiates into a druidic order we don't usually pass those kinds of things on to our children. It's just like until they're old enough to, you know, uh, decide that they want to follow in our footsteps, and then, well, that's okay. You can disseminate whatever it is that you want. But the thing about that is, though, you have a lot of traditions and a lot of practices that are for us that don't tie into anything else, and some things that are. Uh, stereotypes that uh, you know that they say that we can't do that we can and we will talk about some of those um, some of the biggest ones that that are important uh, for druids specifically is the concept of the awen uh, the idea of the other world and what happens to us after death the idea of veneration of our ancestors those who have died in and gone on before us to centuries back, millennia back. We honor the ancestors from the beginning of time. Um, and also, we look at the uh, Druidic idea of reincarnation, which is the Celtic Oversoul, the Anamkara, one soul, many incarnations. Um, and what I'm saying tonight also is like, it's just like any other tradition and any other group. This is a lot of people do this. A lot of people don't. It just depends on what resonates with you and what works best. I'm just giving you ideas and things that are put out there that are being used by other uh, pagan druids around the world, not just you know within traditions, but those who are singular, solitary. There are many that do follow some of these, uh, and then those that don't. It just depends on uh, you know what you're comfortable with, what your mind registers as being appropriate for your spiritual practice. And that's the one thing that is good about paganism and Druidry in general is the fact that these practices are organic, meaning that we can adapt them to the modern age, which we kind of have to. We're no, we are neo-Druids. Neo meaning new. New meaning that we're not existing in that time of, you know, the 1000s so that you know just as Ireland was being settled by the peoples that came to to it we're in a different time so we have to look at it in a different vein of of we are looking at what was thought to be uh juridic thought and practice back then because we have a lot of fractured information um and so we kind of have to go by you know what what makes sense and what we can say that we believe but a lot of this stuff does make sense. That's why many of us are following the Druid tradition in the first place. And it's stuff that if you really look at it and you apply it to your life and how you live as a pagan up until you die, 
it's it's for me it just seems natural like I've said in the very first uh, Druid school class I went for years as a Wiccan I was initiated into a coven um, I practiced magic I went through all these different things but the thing that just seemed a little bit out of the situation for me was the fact that it was dualistic and that you know we concentrated on a god and a goddess but that that was it it just seemed like you know that that the idea of the god and goddess was what we practiced on um, we didn't give to the idea that we are a societal uh, uh, world you know we have different we have different societies different groups and also within that societal uh, construct we have clans and tribes and all this so you're looking you're looking at multiples of things okay so it's like you look at the idea of yin and yang which I have here on my pen um, you know the light and dark male and female that whole kind of thing which is good that's something that we always have as a foundational spiritual practice within paganism but then you have the difference between Wicca and uh, Druidry Wicca tends to be dualistic. There are polytheistic witches, but there tends to be, you know, that dualistic bent. But in Druidry, we tend to be more uh, uh, pantheist, polytheistic, panentheist. We follow more than just mom and dad. There's the aunts, the uncles, the brothers, and, you know, everybody else that's associated with them. And so that gives us practices that a lot of others don't have for an example veneration of the ancestors and the reason why that we venerate we venerate the ancestors so much is for me and you know I, and some of the, the texts and things that I've read and just you know working in general uh, outside of just Samhain and, and whatever else it's the fact that the energy that we get from the earth now is we're getting energy that's not just placed here now we're receiving energy from the beginning of time we're receiving energy from the minute or the first step was taken by the first man the first woman and whatever and so that's what we have to build on so if you ignore that if you ignore the fact that we have those beings that were here before us that have magically done things uh, in various places all around the world shamans in in Iceland and all these different places they are what make the energy grid of the planet. They are what give us the power, not just the trees and the earth and the fae and these other things. It's them too. So uh, we kind of learned early on that the ancestors were important. That's why we gave the idea of what happens after our death so much thought. What you know? What happens to us? Do we add to the conversation? How do we you know? become a part of what the ancestors are doing and it's like uh, there are stories that talk about the places of where uh, death is, is is found as examples uh, graveyards in Ireland you have the uh, barrels the barrel mounds and the menhir stones and the bogs and these other places where people have died and have been their remains have been placed um, and those places are, are sacred, but they're all magical because the, the, the ancestors that are there are the ones that are adding to the energy of that place. And when you have all of these different places all over the world that are burial mounds and burial places, the idea of venerated dead are very important. The, the Native Americans, uh, the Peruvians, uh, the Aztecs, uh, the Egyptians, all gave great place and value to their dead they weren't their dead weren't discarded they were honored more sometimes than they were in life as an example the Celts in uh, their move across the uh, European landmass uh, at times there would be those that were great chiefs and kings that had grown up uh, during this movement and whenever they died they were placed in burial caves and mounds with horses they were placed there with uh, buggies carts uh, eating utensils clothing uh, food um, large barrels and, and uh, ceramic vessels full of honey and mead 
and all these different things because the people wanted them to go into the next life into the into the next world um, and be prepared and be ready uh, but also in their station you know they were honored even you know they had servants that were buried with them and various things and so it's like you know we kind of don't we, we kind of don't pay that much attention a lot of days in modern times you know we do have eulogies and funerals and things for our loved ones and stuff but to the degree that the ancient Celtic peoples and the ancient pagan peoples have uh, done we kind of don't hit that level anymore and one thing that I think is important as a uh, funerary practice that kind of needs to come back I believe for those that are not specifically going to be uh, cremated at the at the end of their life I think we should go back to the practice of grave goods um, you know blankets and and just you know honorary things that we place with our with our honored dead as we send them into the next world because um, I think it's a good practice to have it builds their it builds their energy uh, to come back I think that um, forgotten spirits are harder to reincarnate than those that were you know given a higher place in society during their time but I do believe that we reincarnate that's another thing uh, there are religious traditions that don't believe in reincarnation. It's just once you die, you're bug food. I don't believe that. I think that our lives are worth more than that. I think our existence is worth more than just 70 or 80 years and then it's over with. I think that um, the idea of a religious system, a religious philosophy that says that the gods are important, that the people that are existing on this planet right now are important and that the ancestors who have died and passed on before are just as important there's nobody that's given uh, outside of you know social status and uh, they're they're not given any kind of, of short sightedness because you know they're you know they're in, in one plane of existence or another it's not uh, with Druidry we don't think that the dead are out of sight out of mind we honor them. That's why we do what we do on Samhain. Samhain is one of the more important times of the year for us because it gives us a chance to really connect with the spirits of the dead to uh, and our loved ones and things like that. And I think that that is something that uh, we can at various times during the year, not just at Samhain, um, but uh, you know through various rituals and things. Uh, be able to kind of tap into that energy and use it for what we need to help heal the earth, to help heal people's minds and do these different things because you know if you just try to stick into just working magic is with earth as the vernacular and you don't really go the full gamut of what you can tap, tap into you're not going to be as effective um, as you could be if you really you know researched and looked into what it is that you want to do and then how you do it so the ancestors are very important um, a lot of traditions also and we're going to talk about the main uh, topic of tonight one of the main things that a lot of traditions go over is how we have to be balanced in what we do with our with you know our lives with how we react to society and how we work magic and um, within that vein we have the concept of all in and if you don't know what the all in is this is my all in symbol that I use on my altar it is three rays with, with two points of light emanating above it and it talks about the idea of the Awen when you look at the, uh, the the rays of light you see male and female balanced by by that third ray that middle ray that keeps things uh, cosmically together also uh, the idea of Awen is past present and future um, there are like 20 or 30 different things that the Awen really ties into um, the Awen is not distinctly an Irish uh, uh, concept. Imrama is part of that. 
uh, which we'll talk to that once we get into some of the distinctly Irish things that are uh, tied into Druidry. But the idea of the word Awen comes from the Welsh. But it's been, uh, you know, over the centuries, uh, universally adopted by um, uh, various Druids, whether it's from Britain or Ireland or Spain or wherever. Just the concept of balance. And that's the thing. It's like we don't, the idea of balance is not, you know, teetering on the edge and, and you know, just not taking chances. But the idea of balance is um, for everything that's negative in the universe, there has to be something pos positive to keep it in check. And, you know, you've got the idea that a lot of people go through uh, in witchcraft, the idea of the reed and the idea of Anaharm, the Anaharm none do what you will, and also the idea of everything coming back to you in threes. Well, it does kind of happen to be like that a little bit with the idea of Owen, but also also the three rays are rays of inspiration. And that's something else we'll get into here just a little bit. But the idea of this for balance is, is not the idea of just being always mindful of karma. I think anybody that practices magic and works a spiritual magical tradition, such as Druidry and witchcraft and some of these other things, pagan traditions, we kind of know that, but it's up to what do we want to do with the magic that we work? And, uh, you know, do we want to be helpful to society or do we not? And the thing about that is some people are like that. They want to be a pain in the ass. And uh, that's fine. You know, that's their prerogative. They can do what they want. But you got to realize for everybody that's out there in that magical world being like that, you have us that are, excuse me, my nose is really itching in that. Um, we have us as that counterbalance, that weight that doesn't let anything get too much above the other. You want, you want things harmonious as much as possible. Now, right now, with the situation in the world, it's not very harmonious. Uh, because of the simple fact that we don't know what's going to go on. But this is one of the more important times that the idea of Awen is is crucial because once you start really living it every day and realizing, okay, you know, there's not a lot I can do with the situation outside my door, but where I'm at right now in my house, in my home, with my wife, my kids, my grandma, grandpa, whoever it is that you have to deal with on a daily basis, even through this, you can choose to work the all in to where, you know, you can be the balance in other people's life. Sometimes you, you can't. You have to uh, step back and do things for yourself. And that's fair. You're not, the gods and the universe are not going to jump on your back if you're selfish every once in a while. It's just the idea of going off in extremes. And uh, I think that... Uh, Anybody that works this for any amount of time, it gives you a little bit of peace of mind. I mean, there are benefits to the idea of balance. Um, the idea that you won't push yourself off into a situation that you can't deal with because of the fact that you're not going into an extreme. Um, you know, the, they, they have that old saying, you can choose, uh, uh, you can get glad in the pants you got mad in. That's the same way it is with uh, Owen. You can choose to, you know, you might have all these negative things going on, but you can choose to turn that around and make a negative a positive. And when you do that, you're the one that is affecting um, the, the balance in the world. And you can see that. Another thing is uh, there is inspiration um, in the Awen. The inspiration is for those that are the bards, um, those that are the healers, those that are the leaders of the traditions, the leaders of ritual, um, those those sparks of knowledge, the fire in the head, which we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. Um, these are the things that the Awen bring as well. If you've ever seen uh, the pictures of Bridget with the crown with the candles in it, the a lot of times you'll see that where it's just three candles lit. And those three candles are representative of the Awen. Um, Bridget is highly tied to the concept of Awen. Um, and so whenever you're 
writing or uh, trying to think of writing a story or writing a poem or a song or want to do something creative like painting or you know just whatever you want to do there are ways that you can work with the Awen at your altar uh, light a candle have an Awen symbol there and just concentrate on the idea of letting the ideas flow from the universe from the gods from the earth from the ancestors and letting that balance come in that inspiration that says okay this is what I want to write for this story there are ideas that are coming across that I can put down on paper um, there may be times that the Awen may not hit you whenever you're working ritual you could be in the shower and sometimes people have written some of their best music or poetry or whatever when they're singing in the shower and you get those aha moments and you get out and you go write it down um, and that works the same way with a new healing idea a new way for you to do divination and things like that uh, that can you know uh, influence your situation now one thing is like a lot of people kind of take the idea that uh, and I need to dispel this because a lot of people have this idea that druids are just old men that uh, go out in the woods every once in a while and cut down mistletoe off a tree and do whatever well for one druids were men and women so we'll get that out of the way and we're gonna do a class on women and druidry which that'll come later on down the road but yes women were in druidry um, but also the idea that the druids weren't all necessarily goody two-shoe you know they had jobs that they had to do that affected many people um, they were uh, messengers and things for the kings and what have you so uh, the idea of going from place to place across Ireland and the various other areas that they had to travel were um, uh, you know fraught with danger a lot of times uh, but then again also is it is said that uh, druids were able to pass freely between tribes because it was considered bad you know it was superstition bad luck to uh, mess with a druid in, in a wrong way now that you also have to think of the fact that even though like I said in one of the classes earlier that the uh, Romans never conquered the Irish the Romans did get a hold of uh, get a hold of England and did a lot of harm there but as far as Ireland proper they never got a foothold there so what that meant was when it was because of the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of invasive uh, intruders into Ireland itself that means that there was a lot of time on the Irish uh, people's hands that they were involved in intertribal warfare now with that case uh, the idea it's like uh, you have witchcraft that says ain't harm none do what thou will um, you know that the whole fluffy bunny you know do no harm kind of thing well uh, there's also the maxim a witch you cannot he hex cannot heal well on the same side of that um, for druidry there is no concept per se of the reed in that druids could cast curses and the form of curse could be considered uh, you know situational but the idea of the curse is called a lorica l-o-r-i-c-a and what that is is let's say uh, you have two warring factions in a valley one on one side one on the other and then there is a tall hill that overlooks them and or a couple tall hills that overlooks them and on the tops of those hills would be druids standing there basically with the hands raised up to the gods and what they would be doing is basically saying these guys over here they suck so bad they're horrible and our people are going to kick their ass today blah 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 in whatever terms and, and things that they were saying basically a lorica is a taunt it's a nanani boo boo you can't get us it is a demeaning type of satire um, something that is meant to demoralize and to make the troops of the other side uh, not want to fight you they want they want their lorica to be so powerful that they don't necessarily have to come to blows because the the, the effect of the magic of that lorica was so powerful that basically both 
or the one you know one side decides to okay well we're not going to fight these guys um, we're just going to you know take off and leave the situation so that's another thing druids as far as in those times and to a degree now we're not all necessarily goody two shoes in that like if somebody messes with someone I love or a family member or a friend or somebody from Facebook or it, it doesn't matter um, if it's in a bad enough situation I'll work a Lorica now that's another thing it depends on every year you, you, we also have to temper that with the all win you have to think well how far do I want to go because if you go the ultimate route and you wish death upon somebody it could boomerang and kick back on you so it depends on where you want to go with that situation but um, no tea no shade in the sense that you don't want to let people just walk over you I mean you know why do we why do we practice magic if we're just going to be uh, spiritually uh, easy to get over on you know that's not right it's like these people that have come through the monotheistic traditions uh, the faith healers and given them millions and millions of dollars to get mansions and, and airplanes and all these different things and stuff but uh, you know then, then they try to get healed of cancer and these other things and it doesn't work you know and it's not gonna work because that faith healer doesn't want to heal you he wants to uh, thin down your wallet and your bank account you know and that's the one thing it's like as as pagans and some people have asked me well why do you want to be pagan in the first place I go well for one thing we're not gonna be knocking on your door at six o'clock in the morning going have you heard the word of the goddess we don't work like that uh, paganism tends to not be uh, proselytizing we don't holy crap we've got 290 people here good to have you guys aboard uh, if everything's before we go any further if you guys can hear me okay uh, give me some thumbs up send them across the thing and uh, I just want to thank everybody that's here um, but uh, yeah it's like you know we don't uh, that's the one thing it's like we tend to be a little bit more on the warrior side of things which is no, there's nothing wrong with that because of the fact that you know uh, a lot of people that have uh, come out of paganism or come into paganism were in those monotheistic traditions I for one was involved in the Pentecostal Church for 11 years before I even became pagan and the thing that kind of that did it for me was the fact that the spiritual concepts that stuff that you know that they that they tried to impart was from the Bible and whenever you ask a preacher about well the Bible then you go okay well why is this this and this that way and they go because it's in the Bible and then I go okay but can you tell me the reason for that without telling me it's in the Bible I need a little bit more I'm not getting the idea those those words and those verses and all these things they don't make sense to me uh, why is that the way it is and they go because it's the Word of God and that's the way it is okay that's where you get me right there is the fact that uh, pagan traditions we don't necessarily need a book we don't have to have a Bible that gives us uh, you know chapter and verse why the gods say this and why the gods do that because most of the time what those things that they say that the God said is bullshit you know it's something that a man wrote down on the papyrus and then later on in 1611 King James got a hold of it and did his thing with it and now that's the book that these people are basing their tradition on and it's like but for me I don't need that but when I step outside and I see children playing when I see birds in the trees when I see dogs running after footballs when I see uh, critters out in the wilderness uh, whenever I see some of the things that are exampled of wildlife around the world when you look at it and you go okay that's what it's about I don't need a book I don't need uh, you know that interpretation of things that it's only this way because God said so um, you look at the stories and the myths of the Celtic gods and say there's nothing in in them that I have found necessarily that is absolutist uh, meaning that you know okay well this is the way it is and you have to stick to it and that's it and uh, speaking of that I'm gonna take another drink here 
we got some stuff to go over that I've got over here next to me that I've written down in some notes. And I just want to say hello to all 315 people that are here tonight. I want to thank you guys. Um, if you have any questions or if you have any comments, go ahead and type them out and I'll respond. And we'll just have a conversation about this, you know. Uh, make it a back and forth kind of exchange of ide uh, ideas and things. What do you think about the idea of the ancestors? What are your thoughts on balance? And give me just a second and we'll get on with this. Some more of the shot. That's good. Like I said last week, when it comes to working with spiritual ideas and stuff, I highly recommend that you get a notebook, something that might be separated from your actual book of ritual that you write for your group or your family or for yourself or whatever, just something that you can keep separate where you can keep notes because you, you know, th even, you know, as uh, through Wicca and some of these other things, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of ideas that it will put in your head that you may not necessarily find written about in a book so you want to kind of write those things down for yourself so that you can come back to them over time and see how they affect you spiritually and stuff so let me get this light here where I can see a little bit better and it's looking like we're gonna have some rain here in just a little bit so if it starts to thunder bear with me All right, going past some ritual scripts here. Some of the things that, uh, one of the first things that I came across whenever I very first started doing the practice was um, something that I found a long time ago, and I still think that it is very important today. It's called the Druid's Code, and it says this, A Druid is open to the sources of power. All these things that you have said you will do, I will do also. And that is from the Dagda. Hey, Sean, good to have you. Hope you're feeling better. Um, a druid is a student and master of wisdom. A warrior named Samaldonic and all the arts which help your people, he practices them all so that he is a man of each and every part. A druid practices the nine parts of magic. I am very small, very great, very bright, very hard, angriness of fire, fire of speech, noise of knowledge, well of wisdom, sword of song. A druid is freeborn through the act of sacrifice. And we'll talk about sacrifice more here in just a second. I am the son of the man, of the man without a father who was buried in his mother's womb who was blessed after his death. Indeed, death betrothed him, and he was the first utterance of every living one, the cry of every dead one. Lofty aim was his name. A druid maintains order and balance. Now, sacrifice, uh, that's one thing that we get a bad rap for. Everybody says, oh, well, pagans do, uh, you know, sacrifices. To a degree, we do. Um, as an example, uh, when we are at a ritual situation and we have grain on the altar and we offer it up to the gods as a sacrifice for the year, uh, you know, for the things that we've done, we're not sacrificing in a malicious, uh, you know, malevolent, satanic kind of way that they, you know, that, that society expects. We're doing it as an honoring of the gods and the goddess and the earth for feeding us, for taking care of us. Uh, we do the same thing with animals. A lot of people will do animal sacrifices. Now, the animal, the idea of animal sacrifices is not satanic. The idea is an animal was brought to, brought to its, you know, conclusion. It is, you know, is grown, fed, taken care of, and then at a certain time, it is ritually slaughtered. And it, uh, with that, what that means is. Not only is it just, it's not killed for 
for you know for joy and for just the sake of killing it is killed for the meat that will sustain the family um, a lot of people know how to use the bones to make implements uh, for you know ritual uh, implements for working around their their farms and homesteads and things like that so the idea of the Hollywoodization of sacrifice it's not that it is a whole different thing so when somebody asks you do druids do sacrifice you kind of have to qualify their question and tell them about it because too many people have just said yeah and the other is instance is if any of you have watched the movie the wicker man um, to a degree things like the wicker man have happened in celtic history but the idea of them luring a a uh, a uh, innocent Christian to his doom to make the crops grow it wasn't like that the idea of the, the, the wicker man was the idea that at certain times uh, animals would be placed within the wicker effigy and could be slaughtered and the only times that a human was ever considered to be placed within the wicker effigy is if they were murderers, rapists, killers, just bad people in general and they would be given the trial and if they were found not worthy of remaining with the tribe or you know the clan or whatever they might be placed within the wicker effigy to be burned with the other uh, with the other uh, uh, things that were placed within it as a form of corporal punishment. We have corporal punishment today they had corporal punishment then but it wasn't nefarious in that you know that they were just going around and grabbing young girls and everybody and and and, and uh, you know Christians to throw in there that's not the way that it went down um, and it wasn't something that was uh, massively practiced it wasn't you know something that was done a lot but it it was there were instances that it was uh, we have uh, uh, writers like Pliny and Strabo and see that's another thing that kind of sucks for Druidry is the fact that a lot of modern interpretation of what the Druids did in ancient times were uh, secondhand reports brought to by uh, observers of Druid practices by the Romans and Greeks and some of these other things so whenever you are a secondhand person involved in these things embellishment kind of becomes the norm for that you never really uh, you never really get the uh, true story like sitting in a circle and playing telephone you'll start with one sentence and by the time it comes back to you it's changed 5,000 times and so you don't necessarily know uh, you know what you're gonna get when it comes back but there is there is historical evidence of some of that uh, as the idea of there were times that um, people were strangled and placed in the bogs the the bog man the the celtic man that was the celtic prince that was found in the bog in denmark that gives us the gunderstrup cauldron um, he was uh, there was the gunderstrup cauldron there was a sword and, and things like that so um, you know he was considered a type of a sacrifice sort of um, and another idea of a sacrifice is in Celtic times, especially in Ireland and such, is that um, uh, items that were precious could be placed in a body of water. Uh, a, 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 a sword that had fought many battles could be lobbed into a river or a lake, which kind of gives us the idea of the Lady of the Lake and the sword and stuff. So there's a lot of traditions that were kind of tied to that. But the idea of giving up something so precious to you um, and giving it up as a sacrifice to the gods could maybe ensure that things that you needed to have happen over a period of time could could happen that, that things could be few could be fruitful so there are a lot of druid traditions whether it's hanja keltry or adf or the aoda or red branch druids or you know whoever it is they have different times through the year and even through the month mind you where rituals are performed that do have sacrificial elements. Uh, the order of standing of every ritual has a sacramental, sacramental element. 
but uh, it's to different degrees um, and depending on the time of the year. Um, the gods must be worshipped and no evil done and right behavior maintained. A druid is honored by the people. Among all the Gaelic peoples, generally speaking, there are three sets of men who are held in exceptional honor, the bards, the vates, and the druids. The bards are singers and poets, the vates are diviners and natural philosophers, while the druids, in addition to natural philosophy, study also moral philosophy, and that was an observation by Strabo. A druid lives many lives. The soul is immortal. A druid looks beyond life. The same spirit has a body again elsewhere. That means the, the, what we're talking about, the Anamkara, uh, the idea of the Celtic Oversoul. One spirit, you have that beginning point, and then you go through many existences until... Now here's, here's where I kind of, uh, uh, you know, go into the realm of, of uh, how reincarnation works. And speaking of that, one thing that I recommend it's not necessarily a druidically titled book, uh, but something that deals really wonderfully with the topic of balance and energy and reincarnation and the all and that kind of thing is I highly recommend. And you can find it in PDF format or you can order it, which I have a beautiful hardback cover in my bedroom. It's called The Kybalion by Three Initiates. It's a book of hermetic philosophy which deals with the concept of the all. And um, what it is, is, uh, you know, we have that one, we have our starting point. Everybody has that point A in existence. Um, this body that I'm talking to you in now is not my first existence. This could be my hundredth, two hundredth, whatever. And that's another thing. I highly recommend that if you have the interest, uh, find someone that is uh, uh, trained in hypnotherapy to where you can do past life regression. Um, I'm very fascinated by the, the subject. And um, there's things that you can teach yourself. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. We're going to get into more of the uh, uh, magical side of, of how we deal with moving on to the next life. Because that's another thing the Druids did is they, they prepared spells for themselves so that they could ensure that they had a good transition over into the other world um, and things like that. So later on, as we progress in classes and different work, uh, we're going to uh, be talking about that. And eventually, I may try to get a camera set up to where we can uh, uh, visualize some of that and have it. Uh, I can do that uh, live for you guys and kind of give you an, an idea of what that, what that might look like, what those practices might look like. Um, a druid looks beyond beyond life. A druid knows the ecstasy of Imbus, which Imbus is kind of the alter the alternate point of Awen. Im uh, Awen is the balance. Imbus is the experience that comes with balance. Um, the gods touch a person through divine and human joys, so that they are able to speak prophetic poems and dispense wisdom and perform miracles. So that means it's it's experiential. It's it's getting out there and working on the front lines, not letting you know the high priest or high priestess of your grove or group do it. This is something that you can do yourself. A druid becomes one with the gods. We aren't separate from our. If you've ever heard the uh, Church of the World saying, uh, "Thou art God and Thou art Goddess," we that's our goal. Everybody wants to become part of of the of the divine. And that's what we do in this lifetime. That's why we have gods in the first place. They explain the phenomena that we can't. And um, that's our longing, you know, through many incarnations, is to not be tied to our bodies, is to be part of the gods. And what that does is like with the idea of the all, is the all is everything beyond the gods. So you have that point A experience where your very first incarnation happens. You go through many, many lives. And what our lives are for is to learn um, and to influence and to help and to, you know, just do these different things. Uh, we learn by getting our hands dirty 
uh, you know, and sometimes lives, our lives aren't great. Uh, sometimes our lives are good. So we have to go through the good and the bad to add to us. I believe that whenever your, your existence begins, you're a very tiny spark. Just, bare, just barely on the tip of my pinky. But as you grow, as your experiences grow, as your lifetimes grow, you start to, that spark begins to grow and grow and grow. And you're learning all these things. And eventually, I believe, that there, that there comes a point in existence, in all that time of eternity, that there becomes a point where your existence, you've learned everything that you need to learn. You have experienced everything that you need to experience. So what happens is, when you hit that point B, that spark is so huge and so bright and so powerful that eventually you disengage from the, the, the cycle of reincarnation and you become a part of the all. Now, the other thing that uh, differentiates pagans and druids from Christianity is Christianity only believes in the reincarnation of your body when you go to heaven. And you're there with Jesus and God and all that stuff, okay? Well, we believe that, you know, we can come back many lives as men and women. Now, there is a, uh, a philosophy that is thought up within various juridic traditions and things that are written down that talk about not just incarnating as men and women, but incarnating as trees, rocks, and it was just coming back as another form on the planet and that's called transubstantiation which uh, there are articles and things written online about it so you can look into that but what that says is we're not tied down to just a male and a female human body or human form that we can come back as anything so an example for that even though you know I might try to hasten that but I don't know if any of you have seen it here on YouTube or maybe on YouTube and Facebook and some of these other uh, outlets but there are uh, companies right now that are forming these um, they look like pods that after you die you can be placed in these pods um, that uh, once they are you're encased in them you're placed in the ground that it basically uh, comes back you become you become a tree uh, you degrade enough to where you're within this pod and it, your nutrients and stuff from your body going into the soil facilitates the growth of an oak tree or a pine or whatever the tree is that they are doing at the time. I don't know exactly what they are. They also have uh, the biodegradable uh, urns where you can be placed in the urn and then the urn is buried and there is a tree that is placed inside of that that can uh, grow in a spot wherever it is planted. So, you know, there's the idea of, of that kind of process. And I've always wanted, been always one of those people that, even though I know it won't happen, but I'm just one of those people that would, like, after I die, just take me out to a distant river somewhere where nobody comes ever, prop me up against a tree, and just leave me there. Just let me go back to you know just let me go back to the earth but um, so it's like that idea and I think not only that but I think that whenever we do go into that state that we take the gods with us you know we worship the gods for all of our existences in some form or another probably maybe I mean I can believe that we would have an existence where we weren't pagan or have any kind of uh, uh, connection to any pantheons or gods or anything like that but right now for those of us that are watching this stream and are here we do have some kind of interest in druidic traditions uh, a lot of pagan traditions do have gods there are monotheistic druids but that is a very rare thing and it is uh, it is out there but that's a whole different philosophy that even I'm kind of not in the loop on so that is uh, one thing um, so it says a druid becomes one with the gods. God of druids, my God above every god, he is the god of the ancient druids. A druid seeks the truth against the world. And what that means is, well then, get into a chariot, boy, and proceed to find out for yourself whether my words are truth. 
So what that means is what I tell you is just a little smidge of what's out there. Um, and that's why we did the, 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 the broadcast the other night of Druid Bookshelf Essentials. And that's why I'm currently working on a PDF that's going to have more books that I wasn't able to include in that broadcast so that you guys can have a, um, a more uh, nuanced look at what Druidry has to offer because you know we've got almost 500 people here good God great to have you guys here tonight but for the out of that 500 people you know there's some that are new to this and they don't understand and they don't get it so you always have to have a point and that's what we're talking about tonight the Druid the, the Druidic spiritual concepts that are kind of the base of things that can that can give you something to stand on um, to work through the rest of it to work through the things that you learn through the OBOD classes or anything that you see online or in your groves or just in meditation yourself and that's one thing that I kind of uh, uh, also recommend is anything that is a spiritual concept that you're working with um, don't be afraid to meditate on it and meditating on, med meditating on it can just be as simple as sitting and just thinking about what the Awin means what what the balance is uh, gazing at the symbol on your altar and just letting it just encase you and just cover you and just let it just melt into every bit of your body and just let it become you because when you do that after you're done there are things that be, uh, you'll be surprised sometimes you know uh, one of the biggest things that I kinda get gri I get a, a gripe about is well pagans don't have faith they're not like Christians. They don't have faith in God. We don't have faith in your God. What we have faith in is our ability to, to learn. We have faith in that when we get up in the morning that the sun's going to be there because the God's put it there. We have faith that when we go out, there's going to be a breeze and we're going to hear laughter and we're going to see the trees moving and we're going to smell the flowers and all these things. We do have faith. We just don't have your faith. We don't have it the way you envision it. Everybody's different. And that's the thing. Um, uh, you know, uh, monotheistic traditions tend to be mostly uh, uh, universalist. Universalist in this is it. It covers everything. There's nothing else. That's it. But I'm one of those people, and a lot of pagans are the same way. We believe that truth is subjective. Truth means different things to different people. Just because I believe in something one way means that doesn't mean that you are going to believe the exact same way. That's why whenever we do these classes, I tell you that everything I'm telling you is from my experience. Um, I'm not as advanced as some, but I am a little bit more than others. I have my own place, my own lane in things that are druidic. Um, you know, my own lane in things that are pagan. But what works for me might not work for you. So I always say, look for things that resonate with your spirit. Look for things that speak to your mind. And then look at it. Now here's the other side of that. There are things that are out there that people put as spiritual concepts for Druidry that are disconcerting at the very least. They are things that uh, don't seem very conducive to a spiritual life. Uh, and a lot of them are just plain bad. And so um, that's one thing you have to learn discernment in that. You know, you look at something, and if it gives you a great big flashing green light, get into it with gusto. Look into it as much as possible. Um, that's why we have the different off off branches of druidry, bardic the bardic arts, and the ovate seers, because that's the way society is. You have people that specialize in different things, and that's why um, you can go, um, you can do all three. You can study the bardic part. You can study the seership, working with herbs, looking into the future, divination, and still learn how to uh, work ritual for your clan as the druid and all these other things you don't have to we don't have to be put into a box we're not like other churches we're not like the monotheistic traditions that say you have to do it this way we don't have to do anything 
we just have to be open to what the gods put into us what we see whenever we step out into the world every day and what we receive when we work magic and when we work with the gods and after that once we start to see the patterns in nature and the things that make sense are the rest of our lives and our existence and how we deal with people becomes so much different, folks I'm, I'm telling you before I got into paganism I was so cynical um, I was very rigid and things like that but like I say when I was in that Pentecostal Christian kind of vein for so long um, I didn't want to hear what people had to say but then whenever I first came into pagan practice um, little bits and things began to crack little little parts began to open up and there was this little light bulbs going off all above me all the time and it got to the point where it's just like I had to study I had to learn things I'm telling you what I went to so many bookstores new baby new baby pagans you're going to have your bank accounts get very thin for a while because you get on this crusade if you want to find every druidic book that you can get your hands on and after a while you're going to realize you spent so much money that it's time to slow down I've done that now I'm very well I'm not I'm not picky with my well I am picky with my money but it's just like I've, I've matured over the years that I know that there are things that you know I can I can get it if I need it but you know most of the time I don't run out and get every new book by Llewellyn or whatever because it's just like it depends on what I'm interested in at the time um, the other the other uh, spiritual concepts that are very important is the idea of not just the meditative side, not just um, uh, win per se, but also the things that we practice. Um, herbalism doesn't seem spiritual, but once you get in front of a candle and you start mashing them in a mortar, pet mortar and pestle, and uh, you know purposing the herbs for what they what they are for, and tying them in to the Celtic practices and things. Of many many years ago it stops being the fact that you're sitting there crushing those herbs in a mortar and pestle it becomes spiritual and then once you realize how spiritual that act of crushing those herbs for the the tincture that you're making or the spell that you're working or whatever um, it becomes it becomes very spiritual the idea of writing a poem um, you know poem poetry uh, cadence is very important to ritual so the bardic side of things is very spiritual not just the idea that you're writing a hymn to the gods or the hymn to the ancestors or whatever as a matter of fact if you want to see a very good example of a druidic hymn um, I would look up and you can find it here online it's called the hymn to Morrigan you can find it in PDF there's there's uh, websites that have it just printed out where you can read it right off the site but it's very it's very cool I like it um, so it's like you can you can see that everything uh, within Druidry has a spiritual a spiritual component now one of the things that I see that is kind of important to delineate uh, Druidry from witchcraft is a lot of times in in Wicca and witchcraft groups they tend to be more self-oriented not necessarily selfish but whenever uh, they do magic, they t they tend to do paycheck magic. Paycheck magic is uh, we need a new car, uh, the coven needs a new uh, coven stead, all these different things um, and stuff. So the the magic tends to be placed towards that, and then you just kind of just go and and run with it. Okay. One thing that I've noticed over the years is that um, a a lot more, not necessarily all, but a lot more druidic work tends to be towards selfless things, healing the earth, healing somebody else, uh, helping somebody else with their situation and things like that. And I think one of the differences too is the fact that yes, druids work magic. Yes, druids cast spells. Maybe not in a Wicca vein or an Azatru vein or a thelemic vein or whatever but it's our own way of doing things as an example um, the casting of the Lorica Lorica is a spell that that's something that you can use 
in a time of defense. You know, whenever you have to take care of yourself and you have to take care of somebody else, you're casting a spell that says, don't fuck with me or anybody that I care about. And, you know, a lot of uh, witches don't necessarily um, see that as beneficial because they believe it goes against their read. For them, it goes against the read. In Druidry, we don't necessarily believe in the read. Another thing, is like as an example, is a spiritual practice. Witches tend to cast circles. Because when casting a circle, that circle is there for the purpose of containing power. Now, and, and directing it and doing what they need to as they make their cone, their circle and cone of power. But for Druidry, whenever we hold ritual, we don't necessarily cast a circle because everywhere is sacred. Uh, we acknowledge the space that we're in in different ways, but we don't necessarily have to walk around the circle with an athami and, uh, you know, do those things and cut doorways and things to let people in. We have other ways that we do that. That's what delineates us and makes us a little bit different from some of the other pagan traditions. But we're uh, no better or no worse. We just have a different way of, way of doing things. As another example, like I've said before, is Wiccan, Wiccan ritual tends to be short, 15, 20 minutes. Um, there are ADF rituals and AODA and some of the OBOD rituals and things that go as long as an average church service, 45 minutes, hour, 15 minutes, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think that, you know, clock watching whenever we're doing our thing as pagan people, we don't really have to do that because we get a better benefit out of the time that we spend with the gods in the first place, I think. Um, and it gives us something to think about. That time that we're spending, it's something that we can take home after we've left the, the grove stead and the grove and done whatever. It's like, it's something that we can take home and, uh, you know, add to our life and add to our practice. Um, so the, the, the things that so you can do herbalism. Big deal, big thing to actually get into. I highly recommend it. And it's easy. Herbalism is fun. I love it. I don't know hey, if you love herbalism, hit the little love button there on your screen because I love it. It's one of the things for making tinctures and making uh, incense and, uh, you know, different things. Also, believe it or not, making mead is kind of herbalism, just a little bit working with uh, honey and things like that, different flavors and stuff. So you can consider making me a type of herbalism if you're, you know, working with different flavors and things for it. Um, also, uh, the idea of divination. Uh, we're going to start talking about in our next class. Matter of fact, our next class that we're going to do next week, the next coming Thursday, this, I'm going to try and keep these classes as much as I can uh, going on Thursdays because it's easy to you know get this in for an hour or so and then a lot of people are making their get out of house and get groceries on Friday kind of thing so we're not going to do anything like that um, and this weekend on Sunday I might pop the computer up and try to set up a table and for anybody who wants to get a hold of me I might do some Ogham readings uh, do three or four here live on the, on the, the uh, Druid School page, and just so that way you can kind of see how what working with Ogham looks like. But in the next um, uh, class, we're going to deal with Ogham and Druid magic, and how it ties into various um, um, aspects. And here tonight, we've just touched on just a very small bit of what uh, the Druid uh, spiritual practices are. But the ones that we touched on tonight, I think are the most important, are the idea of balance, working with the Awin, uh, working with the idea of the ancestors, because that's what so much of our, our, our pagan tradition is. Samhain and all these different things that we do throughout the year are geared towards not just what we do as, as our living selves, but how we deal with the, with the venerated dead that have gone on before us. So those are very important. Um, but like I say, we're going to deal with that. And then what I'm going to try to do is sometime in the future, we're also going to start talking about 
uh, the ideas of sacred Ireland. We're going to talk about the topography and all of the places that are sacred, whether it's Newgrange, uh, the divisions of the five-fifths of Ireland. Um, we're going to start talking about some of the beings, uh, not just the Fae. There are other things that are that are magical that are within Celtic tradition that are not just Fae. There's a bunch of things like that, and there's magic that's tied to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about that. I'm going to give you ideas of things. Matter of fact, when we do this Ogham class uh, coming up next week, we're also going to take a little bit of time. It's like, okay, so you know some of the, the, the Druidic concepts. You know the gods, and you know what Druids were about. The next thing is, and this is the biggest one, but everybody wants to know, how do you set up an altar? Well, we're going to talk about that. It's, it's easy. A lot of people over over get upset you know I can't do it it's easy it's not that hard um, all an altar is is a place for you to come together and connect to the gods connect to the ancestors connect to yourself it's 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 the most easiest thing you can do it's easier to do than magic the setting up of the altar is you know there you do kinda of have to put some thought into it but it's not something that's the end of the world if you quote unquote think that you did it wrong um, everybody's going to be different. Oh, Judy, definitely. We're going to keep this train going for as long as we can. Um, also, these classes here, what I'm going to do after we get done here in a few minutes, what I do is this will go up onto the Druid School page for however it gets up there. I don't know how the Facebook thing algorithm gets it going. But what I'll do is once it's uh, done, because I do have to wait for that to come up, then I can take it and process it and put it on my YouTube page and for anybody that's out there I highly recommend that uh, you check out my YouTube page which is a pagan perspective on YouTube and we've got classes we've got the Druids uh, meditation for uh, health and healing that we did here a few weeks ago um, we've got videos that I've made musical for different uh, pagan songs uh, there is a Samhain ritual reading of um, uh, a hymn to Morgan that I did, which you can check out there. So I highly recommend you to do that. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, leave them on the Druid School page or friend me and inbox me a message, and I'll do the best I can to answer your question. You know, I may not know everything, but I will point you in the right direction. And for those of you that are out there that have never, uh, you know, been uh, involved in these live streams that we've been going on for the last couple of weeks I invite you to come to Facebook just get on uh, the up there at the top type in Missouri Druid School and put in a uh, request to join and as soon as I see your request I'll get you in there and uh, that will get you into the loop of what we're doing here in uh, uh, the live streams also going to bring this up. Um, because of the situation that's going on, uh, this is more than likely going to uh, put a damper on our actual getting together for Beltane out in the world. So what we're going to do is we're holding Beltane in the Park, which is not Beltane in the Park this year, Beltane in the, in the Park 2020. This is our fourth year. Our first year we had close to 100 people show up. It was beautiful. We had a Maypole, food, ritual, kids, drumming. It was awesome. And then every year after that, it just got better and better. Uh, this year, we're more than likely not going to be able to do that. But what we are going to do is on May 2nd at 7 p.m. Or, yeah, uh, starting at 6 and the ritual will be at 7. What we'll do is I'll come on here live and we'll have our own online potluck. We'll sit here and BS and munch and eat a little bit of something and then at the end of that little potluck portion I will have the altar set up which it's beautiful and we were we will have an online Beltane ritual and this year's Beltane is uh, geared toward the idea of fairies at twilight over the last years we've done so much stuff that has honored uh, various realms of the ancestors and ourselves, but one of the most important things with uh, Beltane be, uh, becoming a season of fertility is we have to acknowledge the helpers and Fae that facilitate the crops 
and our flowers and just us. So this year it's going to be a very magical Twilight-esque uh, ritual. So I highly recommend that you guys be around for that. And there is an event for that. Just type in Beltane in the Park 2020 and uh, there is a uh, event page for that that you can go check out and put yourself up on so that you know and with that we're coming into April so we're getting really close I've got the ritual almost all the way written I've got a couple things that I need to adjust for this online format and uh, you can wear your robes you can wear uh, any kind of uh, renaissance clothing that you want to and just sit and, and have your computer on and do this together because just because of the fact that I can't get out in the woods or I can't get out into the park here in town doesn't mean that we as pagans and brothers and sisters can't, together, can't get together for an hour and enjoy ourselves. So I'm going to post the next class, class number four. I'm going to put that in Discover Druidry and Druidry and the other places that I'm involved uh, online here. And holy crap, we're 681 people. Um, so good to have everybody here. Give me a thumbs up and some loves and stuff. I want to see those things fly up there for a minute. I'm glad that you guys are just taking a little bit of time to hang out with me tonight. It's something to do. And it's starting to rain outside, so that's cool. It's going to be a nice evening. I'm going to open the windows. Um, so we're going to get off here in just a second. And we are going to uh, uh, shut this down. Like I say, I'll go ahead and get it processed as quick as I can. Join Missouri Druid School if you feel so inclined. Friend me if you have any questions. And keep an eye out for next week's class. And Sunday, around the same time, 7 o'clock, for those that are interested. Um, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do is uh, just take a couple at random. Those of you who would like to get a Oakham reading done, it's not going to be anything super long. And we'll do a few of them. That way people can learn what it is to work with the Oakham. So having said that, we're going to close this class the way we started it first. Before I do that, we're going to get a little bit of a drink here. And where you're sitting, close your eyes and take a deep breath and hold it. Uh, Until next time, folks, may the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. I'm Reverend Savannah Tree Walker of the Order of Standing Oak and of Missouri Druid School. Here on Facebook, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. And I will see you next Thursday for uh, Druid School Live number four, where we talk about the Ovum and Druid magic. Have a good night, people.